Hello everybody, welcome. Today is a treat for me because I'm a very big fan of this YouTube creator who has been for the last three years, I believe, making a documentary on a topic that I'm deeply interested in because my wife Kanai and I just had a son and I believe this documentary answers a lot of questions that um, I've been thinking about for him. And he's with us, not here in Japan, but via Zoom. He is the creator of the channel called Life Where I'm From. 1.47 million subscribers. Pretty amazing. Greg Lamb. There he is. How you doing, Greg? Hello. You're so high energy, John. And it's so late at night for you. You're supposed to say on? hello, world. I'm so Hello, world. How are yes. you? That's What's how going you... on? Yeah, that's yes. how... Uh, but I have to always... practice it. You know, when I do my Hello World in my intros, I'm always like, Hello World. Wait, Hello World. Is that the face hello you world. use too? You have that like half smile? I, I think so, right. Okay. <laughs> hello World. It. Today, we find ourselves in John's live stream. <laughs> yes, you do. Anyways. Um, so Greg, yeah. again, uh, the creator of Life Where I'm From, a wildly popular channel on the internet. And... You have been working for a very long time on a documentary. I have the page right now on your screen. It's um, oh, really? nice. called Being Japanese, Nihonjin Toa. And sure. uh, it's now on Vimeo for rent and can also purchase a copy, which is pretty cool. Um, what prompted you to make this documentary? You are this not a trick Japanese. question. I didn't know you were going to ask this question. Really? Oh, okay. Well, no, but it's you... a very common question. It's a very common question, and there's so many answers to this. Oh, well, um, what's this, the brief I... one? Because people have short attention spans, I've heard. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Um, well, okay, look at me. I'm I'm actually half Chinese. A lot of people don't know that, but people, if they know my last name is Lam, L-A-M, that's a Chinese name. It's uh, The kanji is actually forest. You know, Hayashi in yeah. Japanese, Lin. Anyways, um, in Canada growing up, I grew up in a really white area, Winnipeg. And so I was like considered Asian Chinese. When I moved to Vancouver, which is a lot of Chinese people there, I was considered like white. And so I kind of had like this mixed identity. Um, but I was always Canadian, right? I could always call myself Canadian. No one would argue with me. Uh, so with my kids, they are kind of like mixed like me as well. But in Japan, for themselves to call them, for them to call themselves Japanese and just have it like that, we're Japanese, it's not so straightforward, right? So I'm wondering why, why is that? Why can you say I'm Canadian in Japan so easily, but not say that in, or sorry, say I'm Canadian in Canada so easily, but in Japan, you can't say I'm Japanese so easily. Yeah, you know, I, for me, I'm somebody with a, a mixed background. Uh, I grew up. My mother's from India. My father is American, but he's got a background in German English. In America, we identify ourselves with whatever we are in our past, American, African-American, Asian-American now. When I was a kid in the 1980s, we didn't do that, all right? We didn't have these um, designations. So when I came to Japan, you were either Japanese or you were a foreigner, right? Gaijin, yeah, gaikokujin, foreigner, yeah. yeah. One of the great things... Um, that I learned from this video, and we're gonna show a trailer of this in a second, is that it kind of puts a little bit more gray into this than I realized. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. A lot of the people that you talk to, and I've got a list of them, and I'm sure you're gonna explain, have like different experiences, different stories about like, are they Japanese? People that question it, even though they are, but they're not. And I, what, why don't you explain? Tell me a little bit about the people that you interviewed. Why did you pick, um, like, I knew you went up to Hokkaido, Okinawa. You went down there to talk to people in Okinawa who historically, they're Japanese, but they're not Japanese. They're Okinawan and got a very interesting point of view. We have the um, Zainichi Koreans, which is a big, very big group in Korea. Generations have been living here, um, have uh, still Korean passports. We have the Nikkei Brazilians that you talk to, as well as um, the uh, Kikoku Shijo, which are returnees back from Japanese born here, lived in the United States and came back to Japan. All these different angles. And there's even more naturalized Japanese 
Um, people that were British or American that became Japanese changed their passport. Um, like when you look at it from all these angles, it's not such an easy thing to say that you are Japanese, is it? Um, in some ways. And I mean, I, I don't think anything's a spoiler because I think looking at the documentary as a whole, just there's so many questions and discussions. So we're going to show clips from the documentary. And I don't think it's going to spoil anything, but one person said, you know, the simplest way you can do it is just nationality. So what's in your passport? If it says Japanese, you're Japanese. If you want to go really basic like that, you know? Um, but of course, throughout the documentary, there are some people who were born and raised in Japan. Like Japanese is their primary language, sometimes their only language. And um, they are still not considered Japanese by some Japanese people. Um, so, but why did I go to all these different places? Like, you know, the Ainu Hokkaido, because they, they've been there for a very long time. They were separate from Japan up until, you know, just maybe about 150 years ago, same as, um, Okinawa as well. They were separate from Japan. So, um, they became Japanese relatively recently in modern history. I know 150 years ago sounds like a long time, but they weren't always Japanese, but now, you know. The government wants them to be considered fully Japanese, you know, um, and even Zionese Koreans, like you're saying, there are some people who's it's their great grandparents or their grandparents who came from Korea to Japan um, and they've been living as Japanese for, you know, a long, long time. So even their parents, they look Japanese, what they do culturally is Japanese, what, what they speak is only Japanese. So, um, and a lot of them naturalized and actually have a Japanese citizenship, but still, if someone finds out that they're originally not, not Japanese generations ago, they might say like, well, they're, you know, they're not really Japanese. So it, it's just interesting to why this is. Yeah. And I'm going to have to answer my son. Now, it was interesting. You have a, um, there's one of the people that you talked to, was, was it Joe? The, um, yeah. Who was bullied a lot when he was a kid. And right, yeah. From Yokosuka. And he did not, he had a pretty normal childhood until about age seven. Right, says. when he went to elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. That's and right. then it just got really bad. He became um, quite bullied. And like for me, as now that my son is, is half, a, he's half Japanese, half, half American, like I, I'm thinking about these things. Well, well, why don't I just show you everybody out there? I put a link in the description if you want to check out and rent or even purchase. I'm somebody who who purchased this video because I think I'm gonna be watching it over and over again um, with Leo when he gets older. But you can rent this on Vimeo, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, let me just show you the trailer, everybody here for the next minute or so. Check this out. What makes a Japanese person Japanese or not? Is it the blood that runs through their veins? a parent they were born to, the country they grew up in. Is it how they look, how they act, how they speak? To seek answers, I went to the far north, Hokkaido, to talk with the Ainu people who have lived on the land for thousands of years. I went to the far south, Okinawa, who've had many influences, from Chinese to American to Japanese. I went all over Japan and met with Zainichi Koreans, whose families came to Japan from Korea generations ago. Nikkei Brazilians, who returned to Japan after generations away. Hafu, who have one Japanese parent and a strong connection to one another. Hikokushijo, who grew up partly outside of Japan and often feel like outsiders upon returning. Refugees, who may have been born and raised in Japan but can struggle to attain citizenship. And I met with naturalized Japanese, who became Japanese later in life. I met with all kinds of Japanese, who are Japanese, but it's complicated. What is being Japanese? Nihonjin deska te kikareta toki ni watashi wa chotto iwakan oboete. Nihonjin dakedo. That's 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 the uh, trailer. Um, I, I it's only about a minute or so uh, long. No, I, I want to hear everything. And and um, look, she said it's complicated. And it is. Yeah. There is a. I, I, I get a list of questions here to ask Greg, but there was a girl wow. that you interviewed um, in Okinawa, and she said this, which yeah. I thought it was really interesting. She said that she has a Japanese passport. Now, Okinawans were not considered Japanese before World War II. There's some history 
with this. They were, but it was complicated. Well, it was actually much before World War II. This is around like Meiji Restoration time, like 1860s, late right. 1860s. They became Japanese. But after at World War II, they actually seized having their Japanese passport. They had a special UQ passport. Special passport. Until like, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was really, I, I didn't know this this occurred, but um, yeah, I met some people and they showed me their documentation. It's like, wow. yeah, we had our own special passport and we needed permission to go into Japan. So between World War II and I think, I want to say 1972, I, I don't remember the dates quite exactly, they were something different. And then after they became part of Japan again. Yeah, yeah I, I, one of the, the, the girl from Okinawa said that she has a Japanese passport, but if they had an Okinawan passport. She would prefer that. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. But I I mean, I think a lot of them seem like they're, they'd be pretty happy with having both, honestly, is what it seemed like. Um, but their identity is, at least the people I interviewed were, were was strongly Okinawan, right? They're really proud of being Okinawan. And I mean, that's just their identity, you know? That's who they are. But they were right. fine being Japanese, so it wasn't. I, I don't think they were like anti-Japan or something. Right, and my camera has frozen here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm like waiting for your reaction here, and yeah, just my reaction is right here. Some dumb smiling face. At me, so. <laughs> hey now, uh, so uh, <laughs> so if what um, so we there's there's a bunch of different kinds of Japanese that you interviewed. Of course, there's there's Japanese by blood. The the pure form of Japanese, I guess. Well, I don't know. it's pure in 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 in, in uh, quotation marks, and that's not my quotation marks. There's a study um, that some professor did uh, 20, 30 years ago uh, that talks about the various traits that you can think about of, of being Japanese: nationality, you know, the plur the pure blood, um, or pure genes. Uh, you could have the language you speak, where you were born, where you grew up, your personal identity, your culture all these different factors where you currently even live in. Right. So, but I mean, how do you realistically trace someone's blood? Right. Are you going to yeah. DNA test everyone in Japan and figure out, okay, what percentage Japanese do you need to be to be Japanese and how accurate are these tests? So it starts, I mean, and then you're starting to get into like eugenics and stuff where people like wanted to have a pure race and then that's didn't work well in history as we know. So, Yeah. <laughs> So what, oh, I got the creepy smile. Oh my gosh. So what, what was your, I, I, don't worry, I can go with, um, I can go with a different camera here as a backup. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can uh, change your, switch your camera. I, I know you're going to be lower here. quality than me and you won't like that. But <laughs> it's all good. Go with your backup cam. What were, what were the different kinds of Japanese, um, you know, cause my wife is Japanese, your wife is Japanese. Can yeah. you go through the list here of the people in the documentary that you you interviewed? We had Ainu, Okinawan, Okinawans. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Ainu, Okinawan. And then we have Zainichi, Korean, uh, Nikkei, Brazilian. So those are Japanese that went to Brazil. I think they're starting in the 1910s, 1920s for better, you know, work life and whatnot. And then came back to Japan. You have um, largely like from the 80s onwards. Uh, we have Hafus, which is a huge group because, you know, there's one Japanese parent, one non-Japanese parent. Um, and so you can get so many different mixes with that. Uh, Kikokushijo, which are people who are, you know, typically Japanese, but they've studied or went abroad overseas during childhood and come back. So culturally, language wise, um, maybe they, they kind of seem different to people. Uh, they definitely don't seem like they fit in. A lot, a lot of people have that experience. Experience. You have uh, the Nikkei community, which are people who left Japan and maybe never ever really came back. So those are like second, third, fourth generation Issei, you know, Nisei, Sansei, Yonsei, uh, like uh, Nikkei American um, are like Canadian, right? So Japanese American, Japanese Canadians. And these are people who went through sometimes the internment camp, or the relatives did, right? right. They're, they're, and they have some interesting history and some troubled history. Um, there, and there's refugees, right, in, in Japan that uh, they might have been born and raised in Japan, 
and only speak Japanese, yet they don't actually have Japanese citizenship. Um, but <laughs> they're otherwise, I mean, they're really Japanese, you know, and naturalized is, is the last you know, major category that I have in the documentary. And those are people that, you know, decide to, you know, switch nationality and become Japanese nationality wise. Now, when I was watching the documentary, it didn't seem like those people had a, it wasn't a tough decision for them to go from, to give up their nationality, their, their passport from where they were born and become a naturalized Japanese. It didn't seem too hard because there was one thing that, that seemed to drive them. They didn't ever not want to be able to come here or like, yeah, you I don't mean, know. that makes sense to me because I mean, you know, being Canadian, I've seen a lot of uh, immigrants uh, become naturalized and become Canadian. And I mean, to me growing up, it seemed like a no brainer choice because, you know, we always hear like in Canada, we grew up like, oh, yeah, Canada's a great country. We have lots of immigrants and people want to come live here and we have a good, you know, life in Canada. So it felt, and we know so many people that, you know, became Canadian. So many people's parents came to Canada for a better life. So it seemed really natural that people would become Canadian, but I guess a big exception with becoming Canadian is that you don't have to give up your nationality, your previous nationality to become Canadian. You can hold, hold dual nationality or, you know, triple nationality. Whereas in Japan for people who naturalized, they do have to give up their former nationality. So, uh, the formerly British person, the formerly American per person, the formerly Canadian person, they all have to give up that nationality, become Japanese, but their life was in Japan, you know? Yeah. They wanted to be Japanese. And so for them, that was the decision. They wanted to be come back to the country and their country was Japan, you know? The, you know, what was really heartbreaking for me um, was the Zainichi Korean community and when that was presented in the documentary, they're like, like Yonsai, like fourth generation living in Japan, kids that only know Japan, can't even speak Korean in some situations, and they still have Korean passports. Is that still the case today, right? Oh, well, mm, they, I mean, so there's a special class, like a special permanent resident for Zainichi Koreans, right? Um, and it's their choice on whether to naturalize and become Japanese or not. The rules for them are, are a lot different from everyone else. So it's a very special case. And for most, they can quite easily become Japanese if they want to. Why don't they become Japanese? It could be for various reasons. One is identity. People don't want to give up their identity, um, which I understand. Like, I mean, um, I wouldn't want to give up my Canadian, you know, passport citizenship to become Japanese, right? I'm happy being a permanent resident of Japan. Um, and my wife, she did not want to give up her Japanese citizenship and become Canadian. She's happy being a permanent resident. Um, so for some people, it's just, you know, they feel their identity is tied to their passport, so they don't want to give it up. But there's a lot of people that did, you know, get yeah. Japanese citizenship and became Japanese. There's a lot, but it's hard to find the numbers because in these census uh, for our, you know, the statistics, the Japanese government keeps, once you naturalize and become Japanese, you're just Japanese. You're not previously anything else. You're just Japanese. Right. There's a comment here that I want to address. Um, again, this is okay. a live stream. I haven't here. been reading the comments, so yeah. I should yeah the, check them out too. A, a, this is in Katakana. A, a Bon writes in here, you are also engrossed with being Japanese. So, so ever you can't change your race or complain about it this has nothing to do with that again one of the reasons why i purchased greg's documentary on being japanese is so that i could explain to my son the the like the way that japan treats um people that are different than them is different than the way we treat people in the united states and canada and elsewhere else in the world elsewhere and for me even after living here for 20 three 24 years now i still can't fully grasp how my son is going to be treated that's why i really wanted to purchase this documentary get the point of view of all these different other people that make up japan and yet so many of them in this documentary they didn't really feel i don't know 
Japanese. Like they, some of them questioned where they fit, and I don't want my son to to have those feelings. So Abon, I don't. I think you're missing the point. Um, I, I don't take the comment too seriously, but. Uh, I think it's important to address it because some people watching this are probably thinking about it. it this is not what this is about. Um, again, like, I, let's go back to uh, some of the people that are uh, Kikoshi, uh, Kikokushijo, which are returnees, um, uh, Japanese that were born in Japan, lived abroad, grew up abroad, and then came back to Japan. And a lot of, I, I was an English teacher and taught children um uh, that returned, returnees, we would call them in English. A lot of them worked at Toyota. They would live in Ohio or Tennessee at the factory. And then when they come back seven or eight years later, their English skills were great and their Japanese skills were not there. After a year of teaching them on returning, they didn't want to speak English because they felt their English level was higher than the other Japanese students at their schools. They were embarrassed. They felt like they didn't fit in. So they started to regress and lose their English skills that they'd learned for years living in the United States to try to become Japanese again. And that was really heartbreaking for me as someone who's trying to teach them English to maintain their level. They didn't want to after a while. Some of them had friends in the United States and wanted to keep that connection, but a lot of them wanted to give it up because of the age they were at, teenagers. What what did, what feelings did you get that? And talking about your own experience, Greg, like, that of your children because they're also in both the school systems. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me think about the, my, my children first. Um, interestingly, when they were going through school and they've been in the Japanese school system for eight years, they didn't initially tell me any, any having any problems with, you know, bullies are feeling different or, you know, people making them feel different in their school. Um, later on, you know, I heard some like stories like, oh, this person called me Gaijin or uh, this person treated me like, you know, like, what are you doing? How, like, you know, like you can't be friends. You have to make an appointment or something like that. Um, but they're like just I mean, out of eight years, I think there was like maybe one or two or three incidents per kid. So it's very, very little. And I think that kids will pick up on anything that's different. So I wouldn't consider my kids especially having a problem so maybe your worries about leo maybe he won't have a problem especially living in tokyo where there's a lot of it's very multicultural now in tokyo and there's a lot of people from around the world there so i think japanese people are getting used to seeing different people speak different languages have different looks to them different cultures the one thing that impressed me at the school that we went to was the principal um he had a special day where the Jap, the grade six class, they gave a presentation to the school and they were presenting about Japan. They asked parents um, from of different nationalities to come and listen to this presentation. Um, and he had us for tea in his office and he's like, oh, what language do you speak at home? He's like, oh, great. You're speaking the, you know, your like native tongue as well. That's great. Keep it up. Like you should really keep your culture, keep your language as well. We love that. And um they would have me come in and uh, do uh, book readings. So I would read books to the kids in English and stuff. So everybody knew, you know, I was Shintaro's father, Aiko's father in school. And it was generally fine. Like I had a very positive experience there. And I think my kids had a pretty good experience as well in the school system. But what you see in the documentary, you know, you're seeing, you're not going to hear a lot of people saying, oh yeah, my childhood was completely normal because that's like, I guess if you have 15 people say that in a row, it's, it's not that interesting. Um, but some people did have fairly normal upbringings, but, you know, we pointed out where there were issues. And sometimes these issues are like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So what it is today, it can be different from what it is in the past, but um, sometimes it depends on the area you live in. Sometimes the, the time period you live in, um, how you look. There's so many different factors involved, so it's speaking not a about, simple answer. Speaking about how you look, um, I, yeah. I, one of the things from the documentary that was fascinating, again, and if you don't know, this is Greg Lamb, just to introduce everybody here. He's the creator for, of the Life Where I'm From channel uh, on YouTube, and for the last three years, he's been working on this documentary called Being Japanese, 
um, which it, when you watch it, you just see so much. Uh, you can see the hard work and love that he put into this. Everything is perfect, Greg. I was super impressed as someone who does this as well. Not as good. Um, but going back to it, looking Japanese is the key. There's been a lot of jokes, a lot of YouTube videos where people are speaking fluent Japanese, going to restaurants, ordering in fluent Japanese, and people not pretending like they can't understand what they're saying because they can't understand that the person who doesn't look Japanese is speaking Japanese. I've had that happen too, where they respond in broken English. And I said, wait, I just talked to you in Japanese. Why can't you? Did I do something wrong with my job? No, they just don't imagine you because of the base, the way that you looked. And you have, we have a kind of a, a, a trailer, kind of a, a clip here from the video on, on looking Japanese. Do you want to introduce this before I show it? I, I actually, there's several clips that are looking Japanese. So I don't know which exact one you're, I think you're, this is you're the one showing. With the, girl, the one with the girl who, what's the number on this one? I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's from the bus, the girl with the bus. Oh, right. Okay. Well, okay. This situation, just to set it up, there's two different uh, ladies in there. One is uh, mother is Japanese. Father is um, black and American. And um, so she, her story's from from the States in New York. So that's what she's telling from. Whereas the other lady, her, how is it? One, one parent is from Czech and one parent is Japanese. Um, and she is talking about a perspective from Japan, just so that you know, like where these are occurring. So one is occurring in America, one is occurring in Japan. Yeah. All right, let's watch this. This is um, a clip sure. on on your appearance looking Japanese. I remember meeting this bus driver who um, saw me and said, you Asian? And I was like, yes. He was like, are you black? And I was like, yes. And he was like, oh, that's cool. And then proceeded to like tell me that he was going to uh, find an oriental woman. <laughs> he was going to quit his job in New York and find an oriental woman. Uh, and he was going to uh, make children like me. <laughs> wow, that's new. Like, I didn't even know what to say. I was in high school and I was in a house. 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 だったみたいです。留学しに来てるのって偉いね。あのお寿司屋さん。やりばいってなんかして日本の文化好きなんだねって。こう見た目で勝手にこうストーリーを作り上げられるというか、あのこういう顔の人が日本の文化に触れていると
or dialects or whatever you want to call it. Right. So what is the typical Japanese sound or way of speaking Japanese? Um, yeah, but I can kind of understand the speaking part because in Canada, I feel like that's probably the biggest indicator you can think of as someone who has grown up in Canada or is Canadian is if you listen to them and you don't hear any, you know, obvious accent, you know, that doesn't sound like a Canadian accent. You'd be like, oh, okay, this person probably is from somewhere else, you know, originally. Like, yeah. So I mean, the history before World War II, before television in Japan, people had regional dialects that were quite strong. So you kind of could get an idea where someone is based on the way that they talk. But with television and radio, it kind of unified the Japanese language to where the older generation, when I travel and I'm in Miyazaki, I can't understand what anybody over the age of 75 is saying. But everybody under, you know, everybody under around 70, they can speak standard Japanese, which is um, pretty much constant no matter where you go now, unified by television and, and radio. Um, of course, Osaka is going to be different, but like I, we don't have, now it's even harder to be, I, I, it's, it's, it's because there were a lot of differences amongst the dialect. Now everybody has the same dialect. Everybody has the same fashion. They have the fame, same dress, everybody. And this is one of the things that a lot of people who come to Japan remark, people dress the same black business suits. They try to conform here in Japan. And if we look different. We can't. It's impossible for me to conform on the way I look. I would, and uh, do you have anything to add to that? It's um, just just an interesting tidbit about the the language you're talking about. Um, yeah, before World War II, before the TV, that you know the accents were, were stronger, the di dialects were like more, more diverse. But um, I found out in in the uh, Tokugawa era before the Meiji era hit. So this is like before the late 18 or before the 1900s. Let's just go there. Um, people, they can only communicate via writing, really. Like even if they're like in a neighboring prefecture, they have to write the kanji out to communicate, you know? And so I had a whole big section that I cut out of the documentary talking about all this, you know, progression of standardizing and becoming like, you know, a more like homogeneous culture. But it's kind of, uh, I think, like a myth that Japan has always been very homogeneous. They're actually in ways more diverse like a hundred years ago than they are today. <laughs> That's, you know, through my series only in Japan, this is one of the win one things that I try to impress on people that Japan has 47 prefectures. And within these prefectures, despite the fact that in the modern era, things are pretty unified, there is a unique culture, unique cuisine, unique everything in each one of these prefectures and even in some of the regions within the prefectures people in akita in the north they have a different they eat more rice than the people down in the south the south they'll eat more noodles i found that fascinating the akita komachi rice more up in the north and down they're eating soba i'm like what it's like do you have kiritampo here which is a famous dish from akita he goes no no they eat that in the north I'm like what so even in within the prefectures there's unique cultures that um, we don't realize. I guess even Japanese themselves don't realize uh, so much anymore. Um, but like, you know, and, and this is what everybody's probably thinking, Greg. Do, do you want to become Japanese? And I like, this is the, the thumbnail and maybe, you, you know, this is like, I personally, yeah, I thanks can go for that first. thumbnail, John. Yeah, thanks a lot, baby. <laughs> but personally, I, I have no desire. I'm American. I'm, I'm proud to be American. I don't want to change being an outsider i don't think that um I, that's not something that I'm, i've never really been interested in i'm happy to being uh, an expat living here but my heart if you ask me is probably straddled between both countries i cheer for both in the olympics i cheer for both i want to see the success for for japan and knowing the japanese heart and and how people are here i have a different way to look at it i have more more i don't know because japan's been so good to me over the last 23 years how, how about you where does your heart lie and have you ever considered becoming japanese right well i think i actually considered i uh, said this earlier where like i'm not going to become japanese i'm happy being a permanent resident and keeping my canes and citizenship and my wife is the opposite are the same she you know wants to be a permanent resident of canada and a citizen of japan and we're both happy with that situation 
Um, but I love Japan. I love living in Japan. Um, I love Japanese culture. So yeah, and like you said, with the Olympics, I cheer for both teams. And I also love Canada and I'm a Canadian citizen, you know, like I love Canadian culture as well. Like it's possible to love more than one thing, you know, and, um, you know, cheer for more than one thing and have more than one identity. Like it doesn't have to be so black and white is what I feel. I think that's where people get stuck on. They're like, well, it has to be like you're for team A or for team B or, you know, team C. Like, why can't you just be for both? You know, like what's what's the problem with that? Yeah, I think in Japan it is more yes or no. There's no middle ground. And in the West, we have such a more diverse uh, population. Again, you said you can't walking around Canada. You can't you tell who someone is by the way that they dress. But in Japan, you kind of can. You can tell who the tourists are versus the the locals based on the way that they dress. But you couldn't do that in the United States or in Canada, could you? No, no, but it's interesting. I can I I feel like I'm fairly good at telling who is Japanese uh, walking on the street in Japan. I don't know if they're like, you know, what their citizenship is or or whatnot or, you know, visa status or or whatever, whatever that is. But just from a distance. I can see, you know, a couple of Japanese people standing there. I'm like, I think they're Japanese. And I'll walk by and I'll hear them speaking Japanese. I'm like, ah, yeah, I got it. Um, and it's the way they dress, right? The fashion and the way they do their makeup. So I think the way you look can really tell, like, you know, where you're from. But in Canada, people look so diverse. You can, I mean, it's really, you can never say with certainty, like, and point out someone say, like, that person is Canadian or not, right? But they can be Japanese and Canadian, you know, like... <laughs> Knows. Right. And this is another thing. I have a lot of friends that are Japanese, um, Japanese American, but they can't speak any Japanese. I speak more Japanese than them. I've had yeah, friends that yeah. were Japanese and I was the translator for them, but they they had a Japanese name. They had a Japanese look to them, right? And they yeah. couldn't speak any Japanese. And this freaked people out when the foreigner is translating. They thought it was a joke. But it's hard to explain that. Look, after World War II and the the uh, internment camps, after this, and in your documentary, you lay this out really well. Um, Japanese families really wanted to prove that they were Japanese and started to. Uh, they didn't teach their kids American. Japanese. You mean that they were American? That they, they were, weren't Japanese, right? But they weren't. Jap- they were American, but they were of Japanese descent. So yeah, that's very important to get this the details right with this, but. Like I, th- and then you have a couple generations from that, and the grandkids have no idea about the the mother tongue of their grandparents. I'm the same. Right. I can't speak Hindi. I can't speak Marathi. I I, my, I was never never taught because it was seen as a useless language for living in America. But now I wish that I had been taught Marathi and Hindi and be able to understand a billion people. Mom, Dad. <laughs> What happened there? Right. Well, it's, it's easy to, easy to say that language, but I think they're probably thinking the best for you. And um, in the specific case of the Nikkei, uh, you know, the Japanese Americans, um, they actually went to like re-education. I mean, you can call it re-education camp, the internment camp, where they were taught Americanism and how to be a good American. And, um, and so they're trying to, I mean, they were locked up, you know, <laughs> essentially. And so if you want to go back in society and prove that you're American, you had to act like an American, which meant speaking English. So you didn't want your kids to go through the same trouble that you did. So you made sure that they learned English. They acted like American and that worked, you know, to integrate into America. But then, you know, a few generations down the road, they can't speak Japanese. They don't know the culture. They go back to Japan. They look fully Japanese. They can't speak it. And Japanese are like, why can't you speak Japanese? And but like so I'm I am Japanese, but I'm American. I'm Japanese American. I'm Nikkei, and and a lot of Japanese actually don't know the history, you know, and they don't understand. So it's right. it's tough for these people that have I guess you know if you want to say like the Japanese blood or the Japanese genes, but they don't have you know the language or the culture, um, and they they feel a loss for this, and it's it's hard for them. And we tell the story too in the documentary. I see. I see that Gil is here watching this. He's also he's a journalist and um, knows a lot about the history on the U.S. side. I you know the, the internment camps. I've been studying more about that history over the last couple of years, and 
um, I, I don't know enough about it uh, to comment, but it, it does have a big impact. Again, the, the Nikkei Brazilians, Japanese um, are all over the world. And I guess when they come back into Japan, it's, just, it's uh, you had, you interviewed some Nikkei Brazilians that um, left Brazil and came in there and they had a, a different experience. Can you talk a little bit about that from the documentary? Um, yeah, well, both the Nikkei Brazilians that ended up in the documentary, I actually interviewed a lot more than what you see in the documentary, but both of them, they only, they, they didn't speak any Japanese to start off with, right? So they had very little Japanese culture, although in, in uh, Brazil, they were considered Japanese, right? People thought of them as Japanese, but they right. go to Japan and then they're like, wait a second, like, I'm not Japanese, um, like, what, what am I, you know, like, they're, I guess, the Brazilian, but in Brazil, they weren't Brazilian, they were the Japanese, so, like, they didn't belong to either place, um, and it's interesting, because one was a, like, blue-collar worker in the factory and stuff, and he had a very positive experience, actually, he said uh, the Japanese were very nice to him, and some took him under the, you know, their wing, and he was, trying, you know, trying to learn Japanese, and um, he had a great time, and this the... was the this was the one in Shimane, right? Yeah, Shimane. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I watched it. And then it. there's Yeah. I, I saw your yeah, your drone footage was was key to that that there's that some of my drone right footage Thank you so in, much. in the document. Yeah. No, you're very yeah. welcome. It's such a although the quality part. was a little bit low. I think Sorry, it was like 1080p. Yeah. I can't not 4K. Compete. Can't compete. Right. Um but your 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 footage from uh where is it? Shiko no not Shikoku. Sorry. Shimane. <laughs> no, 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 no. The other place. Oh Fuji. The factory, yeah, 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 yeah. Suzuka, sorry, Shizuoka, new start with an S. Suzuka, that that factory footage was cool. Um, but getting back on track, the the lady I interviewed, she was working a white collar job, and um, she's trying to learn Japanese, and she wanted to learn Japanese as a kid, but her father's like, kind of like your parents, saying like, oh, Japanese is useless language, so they never taught her. And so when she came to Japan, her friends were giving her advice to say like, don't say you're Japanese, don't say your parents are Japanese, just act like. You know, you're a foreigner and that way people will accept you better because if they find out you're Japanese, they say, well, why don't you speak Japanese? Why don't you do these Japanese things? So it, it was, you know, tough for her as well in that case. This is the question that I want to ask you, Greg. And I, 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 you can in the comments, if you're watching here, you can answer this as well. If you have some experience in this, is it better? Are you better off um, as a visitor being seen as a visitor, as someone living here or a citizen? For me, I think visitors have the best situation coming to Japan. They're, they don't have to adhere to any of the rules or policies, speak the language. And we have the omote nashi culture, meaning if you're a guest, you're treated like royalty. But if you live here, it seems like you're treated a little bit differently. I don't know. It's stricter. You have to know the rules. If I mistakenly put the garbage out on the wrong day, they will crucify me. And I mean that figuratively. They won't actually do that, but it they're very strict and they get upset and if you're a citizen probably it's even stricter you have this huge weight on your shoulders right do you do you think that that is the case i know it's different for my wife than it is for me i'm so relaxed here and she has societal pressures did you did that pick up yeah i mean i know about the pressure because my wife has it's all these unwritten rules right that's, that's those societal pressures you're talking about that exactly she knows about and she has to adhere to whereas you know like you and I can get a pass because we, we look different and we're, we're not Japanese. And so they're like, oh, they don't know because they're not Japanese. And so you can get a pass. Um, but interestingly, the three people that I interviewed for the documentary, the naturalized citizens, they thought it was completely fine being Japanese. I mean, obviously, they wouldn't become Japanese if they didn't think they would have a good time being Japanese. And they said the initial reaction of Japanese people would usually be like, oh, wow, you became Japanese. And they actually would have gratitude, like, oh, thanks for choosing our country. Thank you for becoming Japanese. Like, they're really honored that they would do that. So it's maybe interesting in comparison to what people think would be the reaction of Japanese, but they had very positive reactions. And then after they get over that initial awkwardness of like, oh, okay, you're Japanese. And they're like, okay, sure, you're Japanese. And they treat them normally. And I think the big thing is effort and like integration. So if they're trying to integrate into Japan and do, do things with Japanese people, I think you tend to be fine. 
Um, whereas if you're going to isolate yourself and not try to integrate into society, then I think there can be issues. But the interesting thing about these naturalized people, they said they get the most flack is from non-Japanese, right? Yeah. It's the people online, the people who are saying they can't be Japanese. But the Japanese people, for the, their most part, they don't care. They're like, oh, yeah, thanks. So it's so funny. I, I've been policed by non-Japanese about being Japanese. Have, has that happened to you where there's other foreigners? Well, it's, it's funny when I get policed because I'm not Japanese. I'm not trying to be Japanese, but people are like, you can't be Japanese. I'm like, yeah, I'm not trying to be. I'm not to trying and, to be. We live but, in- but if I was, then what is the problem, right? But <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's really I'm funny. I, I've had but Japanese people don't care. Like for I, the most they part, don't... like, you know, we're generalizing, right? You shouldn't. You know, How, the vast majority why, why... don't care. Why are you walking and eating? You shouldn't do that in Japan. I'm like, and, and like, there's a guy Japanese walking by and he's holding a yakitori on a stick eating it. It's like these little rules. Yeah, we have the social rules. But when foreigners are telling me that and none of the Japanese care, it's not, it's not such a big deal. Chill out, dudes. <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm serious. It's, it's, we, we've been here for a very long time. So uh, we've seen some stuff. It's talking about naturalization, Greg. Uh, I want to show a clip that we have here. And I was interested about about this process. Again, like I, I don't have any desires to do it, but I was curious about the process. And a lot of people are. They ask about it. And uh, the person you interviewed also has a website and talks about it, the process. In Japan, it is not that hard to become a naturalized Japanese, is it? Um, I'll say yes and no to that question. Oh, um, I like that. I think it's, I think it's a lot easier easier than people would imagine um if you are from a you know developed country and have or no, no i shouldn't say that if you have a university education and are a you know professional and you have the skills to get a visa like a professional visa to go work in japan then you just need to spend your time in japan work for five years and then you, you, you can apply to become japanese and as long as you make you know a stable income you don't have to make a lot of money like just really basic income and you can speak like elementary school level Japanese, then you shouldn't have any problem becoming Japanese. It's actually, I find it's much harder to become Canadian or American than it is to become Japanese if you're an educated person. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, like, it's very hard to become an American. Unless, if you're born there, it's very easy. You just be born. Yeah, I mean, you, you got married. birthright citizenship just like in Canada, right? You just got to be right. born there, then you, you are. But in Japan, if you're born here, that doesn't make you a citizen. No, which was which is interesting. And I thought this was odd when I first found out about it. But then I did some more, you know, research. And North America is actually more of the exception. The Americas are more of the exception than the rule for birthright citizenship. A lot of countries around the world, even if you're born there, you don't become a citizen automatically. So, yeah. but it is weird to see people in their 20s or in their 30s who are born and raised in Japan. Japan who don't have Japanese citizenship, you know, and they plan to live in Japan all, all their lives, but they don't have Japanese citizenship. It yeah. is bizarre. And we, we've had some in the news recently, refugees that have been living most of their life here, came here as kids, and yeah. now they have to return to a country that they don't even speak the language or know the culture. Um, and it's just weird, especially with Japan with the shrinking population. You think we would be doing a better job of this as a country. And I say this, we, because we live here. Um, I don't know. I'm just a little disappointed about that. But the naturalization process was interesting to me. And the experience is it. And this is where the the um, documentary was very entertaining to me, hearing the stories of naturalized citizens going back to their country with a Japanese passport and having the reverse. I don't know. I, I don't know if this clip, did, did they talk about it in this clip? I mean, yeah, essentially it's the experience of a naturalized Japanese who's, you know, white looking (laughs) and he's going back with a Japanese passport through immigration in America and the UK and people are like, what's going on? They can't understand it. Yeah. It's it's pretty freaky. I don't know if that clip has to do with it, but this is a clip about naturalization. Yeah, I think that's a clip has to do it. I think so. A clip from the um, documentary. Oh, go ahead. So this is a documentary from Greg's um, Vimeo documentary he's been working on this for three years um being japanese nihon jin toa rental 500 yen and you can buy it for 1500 yen to support something he's been doing for for three years good friend of the show um let's take a look at this 
Let's take a look at this clip. Naturalization. When I made the decision, I'd been in Japan for 13 years. And by that time, Japan felt like my country. You get some YouTubers saying they would never naturalize in Japan because they want to be absolutely sure they can always go back to their own country. Um, that's why I naturalized. I wanted to be sure that I could always come back here. So it's kind of funny that when David was returning to his former country, the UK, he encountered some issues. Um, had to line up in the non-UK, non-EU passports lane, which had a much longer queue. Um, got to the front, hand over my passport, and the immigration official looks at it, looks at me. I didn't know they handed these out. First time I went to the US, because that's where my father lives, the guy looks at my passport and says, hmm, Japanese passport. Why do you have a British accent then? My accent. Um, my only theory is that he's had sensitivity training and has been told you do not tell people they do not look like their passport, but hadn't been told not to tell them they don't sound like their passport. Another visit to the UK, the guy told me, well, you don't exactly look like a typical Japanese businessman, do you? Uh, no, no. Have you been to the UK before? Yes, yes, um, a bit. Wow, never seen this before. Someone not of Japanese descent with a Japanese passport. And the guy who was actually studying me says, yes, but is this okay? Hang on a minute. You're actually thinking about not allowing me to enter the UK because I'm white on a Japanese passport. That's interesting. That's pretty, I love that clip. And we were, we were talking about it. You couldn't hear us. We're, we're kind of talking about how his facial expressions are so funny um, because in that situation, I can't even imagine. But it, you know, it, we, again, like it's it, abroad. When you see a Japanese passport, you're expecting a Japanese face because 99.9 .9 something percent of people from Japan look, have a look to them and he does not. And there's no name Again, we have names for everybody, like, uh, you know, Zainichi Koreans and Nikkei Brazili. There's no name for somebody who's a naturalized um, Japanese that has white, that's white or black or uh, just unusual. Doesn't look Japanese. For Japanese, look Japanese that don't look right. like the Japanese, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I, I, I bet you he has, I, he has a, a ton of stories about even more than the documentary. It, well, well, tell me, I mean, like... This is a reason why, and in the documentary, you should watch it on why he, he explains why he wanted to be a naturalized Japanese and the, the reasoning for it, I can completely understand. And that would be, his reasoning is probably the reason why I might want to do it too um, one day. I, but I, it's not something that's uh, even on my radar right now, but it's just funny, the stories that you <laughs> hear, like the password can control um, on the other side, having kind of a reverse shock, and then having on the Japanese side being very polite about. Oh it. yeah, well you, that wasn't in the clip though, so people didn't, oh, oh. didn't see that. But no, no, it's it's not. It doesn't matter. I just you I know how long do you rules. keep these clips? But um, when he went into Japan, people didn't have any reaction at all. They're like, they just look at passport, like okay, let him in. No reaction on the Japanese side ever coming into Japan. It's always going you know into a different country, a non-Japanese country that people react to him. So, and maybe that's like what we were saying is like Japanese people seem to be fairly accepting of naturalized citizens, but on the opposite end, it's like the non-Japanese that are like, what, how can you be Japanese? You don't look Japanese. Like they kind of like, they can't understand. Yeah. I, I think through this whole journey of being Japanese, the documentary, and I could totally see this on Netflix and Hulu one day. This is, it's so well produced and done. It's uh, just a little bit under two hours. It could have been seven hours, right? How it did was. you the edit it? The first cut was like six hours. <laughs> I bet you there's a director's cut in here, right? There's got to be no, like six no, hours long. No. It's too, Saga. oh, I mean, I have a cut. I have a cut that is six hours, but it's it's very, I mean, boring to watch, I would think. Being Japanese Our... Saga. No, no. I mean, I could have broke it up into like a lot longer parts, but it just it would take so much longer to make, you know, and I just wanted to wrap it up into something that seemed like a watchful time frame, although two hours is a long time to watch if you're not into the subject. You it know? did not seem that long because of this. 
the the editing, the flow of it, the even the narr. I was impressed with your narration too, Greg. I thought it was really. really I tried good. to keep that to a minimum. My first cut, actually, I didn't have any narration whatsoever, but you kind of had to like figure out why are all these clips in the way they are and happening. So, but you could yeah, have made this. Talk less. You could have just made this one big manga, couldn't you? Because the the image, the manga illustrations in here are really well done. I was really happy with that. And I found this guy kind of, I was looking and I uh, put out a call on social media asking for artists to help illustrate and uh, just nothing seemed to fit like what I was looking for. And then one day I was walking around and um, I saw this poster and I'm like, oh wait, this is kind of the artwork I would like. And so I snapped a picture of the artwork and then later on, you know, we saw that he had a signature on it. So we looked up and like had a Twitter handle, Instagram, and we looked at the images and like, oh, wow, this person lives in Tokyo. So we contacted the person and they were interested in, you know, illustrating these parts for the documentary. And uh, that worked out really well. I was really happy that he could, you know, bring to life some of the stories that people had. Um, we're going to wrap this out now and uh, take a look at some of the questions here. This is the part of the live stream where if you have a question for Greg, a serious question. Yeah, yeah, I let's see. answer some questions. Yeah. yeah, there's some serious questions here, all right? Nothing weird. Uh, let's ask Greg. <clears throat> I, I wanted to ask you, um, we're going to do an Instagram live stream for a little bit after this, uh, which is a different format um, on Only in Japan TV. I, I want to talk to you about Ichiro and Otani and them living in Japan, and I want to hear your thoughts on on what their experience is now that we've kind of seen on both sides. I wonder what Shohei Otani is going through right now as someone who is- Yeah, I don't know. I have no opinion on this. Well, I will, I will pluck away at this and I will, I will I'll expose your core on these important issues of the day. Let's look here at some of the questions that we must have come in here. Question, will be great it started with will, so it was a question. Will it be great to be on Netflix or any platforms? That's not a question, but I like that <laughs> way of thinking. And it started with will. I thought it was a question. No, um, no. Um, thanks for coming on, Greg. Are you coming back to Japan, right, in Sherry? Yeah, ca Greg is in Canada now. Are can I tell them that? Oh my gosh, should it, did I just expose? No, I'm currently in Canada. Yeah, right, okay. But, yeah, I'll be back in Different Japan. Different time zone. So. It's, it's yeah, 2 a.m. Yeah. for me. It's um, like 10 a.m. for you. It's 10, 10 a.m. right now. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'll be back in Japan soon enough. Do Just miss... pandemic is kind of, uh, you know, mixing up plans, you know? Do you miss yeah. Japan a little bit? Yeah, I definitely do. The biggest thing I, I miss is the, uh, the sento, the public baths, the onsens, you know? I would go there weekly, and I just miss it so much doing that. Uh, but, you know, like... My, my house is over there too, of course. So I miss the house, uh, miss the family over there, miss the food, like lots of stuff. Uh, yeah, definitely. Here's one. Um, you've said visiting your kids' schools has been generally good. Do you think they've experienced issues being half as children already? This comes from uh, <sighs> Zali QQ. I feel, I feel honestly like... Uh, like Shin, I don't think he cares that much about it. So he, he's pretty fine. And I hear that often talking to people that, you know, one sibling will be like just totally blase about things. They don't care. They're fine. Another one will like feel something pretty deeply. So I think, um, you know, Aiko, she, you know, internalizes things more, thinks about it more. And maybe see th sees things that aren't necessarily there more, right? Like um, she's always wondering what how people are feeling. And I understand that because that's what I felt growing up too. I always wondered like what people were thinking of me and whatnot. Uh, but in turn of in terms of actual like big problems, as far as we know, there there haven't been any. Um, and I was surprised, like I said before, that um, how encouraging the school was and other like parents and, and people were of um, you know, our identities. And we have a lot of uh, you know, friends and family that want to come visit us, you know, when we're like, oh, when, when, you, when are you going to Canada? We want to come to and see and check it out. And they're interested in visiting Canada and stuff. So overall, like if you have to weigh out the pros and cons, there's a lot been more, more pros than cons from my perspective as a parent. Yeah. But, you know, my kids might say something different and they might say something in five years that I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that, you know, so they're, we'll find out. They're, they're evolving as, as teenagers do. And my question is, 
<laughs> I got lots. I got more questions. Do do they do they like being in Canada or Japan better? I would say Japan better. They're, they've grown up. Most of their memories are from Japan, right? So they like Japan better at this current moment. Um, but you know, when we were in Canada, they liked Canada better. Right. So because they they were born in Canada, so I think you just get used to the place you're living. And I mean, if you're happy there, then you're going to like it. And so they weren't unhappy in Japan the whole time they were in Japan, but they did have a hard time. You know, like in the initial. Everybody I think has, you know, that initial transition period. It's it's tough. It, come, me coming back to Canada, it was very very tough actually <laughs> transitioning. Bullying is it worse in Japan or in Canada? Uh, it's interesting because I've talked to some parents over here in Canada and they're saying like, yeah, my kid got bullied pretty bad. We switched schools or we had this problem. Um, I think you know, we do things to be aware of bullying, but um, it still happens. So I don't know, without being a kid in both school systems, I don't know if I could honestly answer that, but I don't, my kids didn't experience any harsh bullying in Japan that I am aware of. Uh, so, and it could be just the, the school we're in, right? Like everyone knows everyone in our school. So, um, they seem pretty welcoming and, you know, we were integrated within the community too, right? You know, like we were involved with the PTA and, you know, we, we were seen a lot. So we weren't, it wasn't like we were the strange people, like people knew us. So, yeah, there's a lot of questions that are not related to the topic. So I want to stick to the topic, uh, at hand. What did you think makes kids get more discrimination growing up? So I think that answers it. And look, I, I am different. I'm, I'm brown. And it's, it's hard to hide the, your color in the United States growing up in the 80s. And I was different. Um, a lot of kids bullied me. They thought I knew the crane kick. And they thought that I knew karate because of Daniel LaRusso. And I got beat up. I couldn't defend myself. I had no Mr. Miyagi to... Help he got me beat up out. too, though, if you remember, right? Had what? Before he learned, he oh, got beat true. up badly. That's true. And you well. know what? Right. It did not make any make me any safer that he released a part two and a part three. And this movie he kept <laughs> just following me through my childhood. Thank mm. you, Daniel Larusso. And if if he comes back to Japan, I will track you down, and I will show you what wax on and wax off really means to me, because I on my own experiences as a kid. Growing up, it's hard, Daniel. All right, um, now that that's done, um, I think that's all the questions that we have that's related to this topic. Um, I got even more, and we'll take this over to uh, Instagram for a little bit just to check that out. Um, you also have Instagram, right, Greg? Yeah, I do. It's just life where I'm from. Life where I'm from. I like it. Simple. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. If you do have a question, you can also ask us on Discord. Um, on the Discord server, we'll have a section in the general chat that uh, uh, I'll be talking in and you can always um, uh, question me there and on Instagram you can write questions and leave a comment below and finally I have Greg right here um, the Vimeo is now on your page Life Where I'm From uh, Films Inc check out the documentary Being Japanese produced and created by Greg Lamb of, of Life Where I'm From three years of hard work is just five dollars right 500 yen um and i i purchased a copy so i can watch it forever how long is the rental good for it's like 24 hours no no no. i made it a week because we have behind the scenes it's our documentary so maybe you want to you know take your time watching it go back to some piece of parts um so i want to give people enough time to uh fully enjoy it so it's a one week rental yeah, I'm going to ask you in, on the uh, next live stream on Instagram if, if there were any stories that you encountered that surprised you while making this or anything that you... <laughs> <laughs> anything that Definitely, that, definitely. Definitely, yeah. right? There's got to be a lot of stories. After three years of making this, I'm sure there are even more stories. And and Max, who is another YouTuber, I was really surprised to see him in there um, being half. And, and hearing from him, um, he kind of looks like a, an adult version of Leo in a way. So I'm, I was nice to see oh, him. Okay. He, I, I don't know. Leo's like five months. He's not that much right, grown, right. but Max is a really nice guy. And I was uh, happy to see him in there. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. And a big shout out once again to Greg Lamb. Um, 
uh, creator, producer of the Life Where I'm From channel and documentary artist. Are you ever going to do this again? Final question. Will you ever do no, this again? No, no, no feature like documentaries. Oh, come on. You know you <laughs> want to do it. Admit it. I had planned to do one called Being Canadian, honestly, to like, you know, go the other side, right? And see what it is to be Canadian. Explore that question. Really? Um, but yeah, yeah, I was really planning on doing it like after, but not this moment. I'm all full length documentary burned out, uh, maybe in a few years, or maybe I'll do it in like little parts, but I'm going to stick to a maybe 20 or 30 minute time length for mini docs. And um, I'll be doing series on the channel where I'll explore a topic over a number of videos, but um, it'll be all on YouTube, you know, just on the, on the, either the main channel or the X channel. So yeah, I'll be posting a lot on uh, my channel from here on out for the next little bit. Yeah, I can't get enough of, of, of the YouTube channel uh, as well. And I'm a fan and I'm always watching, looking for the next up, uploads. But this is a, a two-hour version of... It's even better than the stuff you put on YouTube because there's a lot of love It's definitely in different. <laughs> it's definitely different. I did, I did put a lot of effort uh, into it. I did try hard um, to do it. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a heavy topic, you know, for some people. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about your background because it's more in um, video production than, than, than me. So you, you have a lot, this is your background, what you do, and that's why you make it so beautiful and so perfect perfectionist. Greg Lamb, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, once again, check it out on Vimeo. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for having me, John. You're welcome. Thanks Bye -bye. everyone for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.